Hi, I am Bill Hodges, and this is Spotlight on Government. And we have Bryant Johnson, Executive Director of the Hillsborough Office of Neighborhood Relations with us. Bryant, so glad to have you. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. You know, what is neighborhood relations? How can you get your arms around that? Great question. Neighborhood relations was created by the Board of County Commissioners with the purpose of assisting neighborhoods access county services and information. Uh, as we all know, neighborhoods are the building blocks of our community. Yeah, that's so true. Mm -hmm. Neighborhoods as the building blocks. You know, obviously the business district's important, universities a district are important, schools are important, but it really comes down to neighborhoods. That's where we live, that's where we exist, that's where we interact with the rest of our community. So the Board of County Commissioners understood the importance of supporting neighborhoods assisting neighborhood representatives in accessing county services to address issues that they face every day. And that's the primary purpose of the Office of Neighborhood Relations with Hillsborough County. You know, with an aging society, I, I remember when my kids were in school, we knew everybody for two square blocks around us because they all had kids. The kids were over back and forth. Mm -hmm. But as we grew older, we became more isolated because we didn't have those kids as ambassadors throughout the neighborhood. Is this a problem? Uh, that is a problem. I think that's a general trend as our population grows, as our cities and communities change. We've all experienced that. I had the same experience growing up where I knew everyone and everyone knew me, and they all called my parents when I did something I wasn't supposed <laughs> yeah. to do. Uh, so that's changed a little bit, although it still exists to some degree, but maybe at a smaller level within specific neighborhoods. You know, in my neighborhood, I'll get a call from neighbors if something doesn't look right or if they have a question or concern or something. So it still exists just to a smaller level, I think. And what the Neighborhood Relations Office does is we act as a resource for neighborhood representatives to address neighborhood issues. For example, as a neighborhood, you may have a concern about speeding in the neighborhood. You may want to talk to someone about speed abatement, whether it's a speed bump or some other type of uh, speed control device. So your so the office would be is, the one I'd call for that? Exactly. We would Not assist with that department? process. You would not call the police department. I see. We would okay. help navigate that. and. Uh, and provide the information that you would need in order to meet with a hearing master or to set up the meeting, to set up, to begin the process of having analysis done in your neighborhood to determine if there is a problem and if so, what the extent of the problem is, and then educate the neighborhood representatives on what their options are, how to go forward, you know, and what the process will be like if they choose to go forward with it. Now, you actually have two departments that you oversee, is that correct? I do. I also oversee the Citizen Action Center, which is the county's primary central call center. So the, the call center, for the most part, does the exact same thing that Neighborhood Relations does, except for individuals. An individual may call with a question, I have, how do I file this permit, or do I need a permit to do this? Who do I talk to about a code enforcement issue? The, they would call the Citizen Action Center and we could either provide the information to them or direct them to the proper county person to help them with that problem. With neighborhood relations, the representatives generally represent the entire neighborhood and not just an individual's concern. And because it is a neighborhood, you know, we'll take a little bit more of a hands-on approach to walk them through the process of setting up a meeting to address whatever the concern may be, whether it's block watch, if it's speed abatement, as I mentioned, if it's code enforcement issues, whatever the neighborhood issue is, we have the ability to be a little more hands-on to guide that neighborhood through the process. Now, we have a phone number for you, 272-5860. Yes. Is there a special number where an individual would call to that call center? Yes, the Citizen Action Center or the call center, Hillsborough County's call center is 272-5900. And, and currently that call is sta that phone is staffed 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. seven days a week. We 7 to 11? 7 to 11, and we currently only close on Christmas and New Year's. My goodness, let's give that phone number one more time. <laughs> that number and this is for individual concerns, for not any, any neighborhood watch groups or anything, but it's individual. Exactly, exactly. For any information, obviously, if you look in the phone book and you're trying to find a, a number for Hillsborough County, you may see 500 numbers and you're not sure where to begin, you can call 272-5900 and we'll assist in guiding you to the answer that you need. That's Whether sort of like a locator then. It really is a locator and you can write to us uh, on, the, on the web. You can send an email to uh, info at hillsboroughcounty.org 
and ask the exact same type of question. Wow, you know, that's kind of great. You have an I issue. I didn't know that. Absolutely. I've been, I've been going through the morass of county government for years, and I really didn't know there was a central number that I could call. Well, I'm glad to be here to shed that light for you and for the rest of our citizens. We are there. The Citizen Action Center is there to assist in any issue that affects, uh, that's involved with county services as well as neighborhood relations, as I've described. Outstanding. Let's talk then about your other department, where okay. neighborhood groups can come to you. Okay. What can they, what are the kind of problems they might bring to you, and what can they expect as far as assistance? Are, are you actually going to assist them, or are you going to send them in a, in a direction to be assisted? We do both, depending on what the problem is. We will facilitate, uh, the, as I said, the difference with the Neighborhood Relations Division is that we're able to be more hands-on. So if you, as an officer of your homeowner association or your condo association, we realize you're one person, but you may very well represent a thousand people in your neighborhood. So if you have a concern, it's a heightened concern. So we'll walk you through the process. If it's a matter of doing a three-way call to put you in touch with a code enforcement officer, for example, we can do that. If it's a matter of setting up a meeting with Public Works to talk about a drainage issue or you know, overgrowth, or, or something of that nature, then we can set up that meeting. And in some cases, you're fine by yourself. We'll give you that name, the number, we'll put you in touch with the person you need to meet with, and we'll invite you to stay in touch with us, let you know, let us know if you're happy with the service you've received and if you've received the answers that you want. And if not, we can take you in another direction. So if I'm an individual, I go one direction, but if I'm a member of a homeowners association or something where there is a group needed to be represented, mm -hmm. I need to go in that direction. Yeah, contact the Office of Neighborhood Relations at the number you just gave if, if you represent a neighborhood. And for individual questions, regardless of what they are, you know, we get a variety of calls. Just recently I received a call uh, at the Citizen Action Center just inquiring about the use of a county vehicle. They saw a car parked at a place that they thought looked unusual and they wanted to check <laughs> yeah, on that. So they called in. Doing that? They called in and they asked the question, you know, we were able to look it up and verify this car was assigned to this person. This person at that time was attending a meeting at that location and it was perfectly appropriate. So it doesn't matter what the issue is. If you wow. want to call a department specifically, you're more than welcome to do that regardless of what that department is. If you're not sure where to go for information or if you just want a one-stop shop, you call, you talk to one of my folks, they'll document the issue put it in the system and make sure that it's addressed. And if you want to bounce back, we'll be able to contact you or have that department contact you with an explanation to make sure your, your issues are, are, concerned, are, are properly addressed. You know, I, I really and honestly believe, and that's the power of this program more than anything else, I think is getting this kind of information out. Because I constantly hear county government isn't responsive, we can't get to anybody, we can't get anything accomplished, but you can. If you take the right avenues, it's like going on a trip. If you want to go to California, you don't start out going east. Unless you want to long and secure this trip, you're right. You head west. And, and having a number like this and knowing there is a department like this that really cares mm -hmm. is an important facet of getting this information out. It's very important. And we go through great pains to make sure that your concerns are, number one, captured, route it to the right person, addressed and that you get a response. We'll log it in electronically and we will send it to the responsible person. That director gets a copy. They know that they have a staffer who's been assigned to respond to a customer for a particular issue. So that whole system is, is monitored and tracked. So if it falls through the cracks, we can always go back. We have a track record. We could say this issue was addressed to Brian Johnson on this day. What have you done? Have you called Bill back? Have you addressed his concerns? So we can route it. We can ensure that. And we have a system in place to make sure Great. that that happens if it takes too long. If I don't get confirmation that a staffer has received it and has acted on it, then I get a little red flag and I can give that uh, staffer a call to say, you know, this is taking where, a little longer than expected. Exactly. Taking a little longer than expected. You know, where do we stand? Have you contacted the customer? And very often the process of addressing issues are very slow. If you just want to ask me, can I have a list of places to go for uh, food assistance? I can give you a list. But if you ask about speed abatement in your neighborhood, that's a slower process. You know, it may be two weeks before you can have a meeting with the hearing master. That hearing master agrees with your concern. It may be three or four weeks before the hearing master can set up the appropriate meeting with the correct people. And then maybe another couple of weeks before they get to the neighborhood to have a neighborhood meeting because it has to be publicly noticed and put in the newspapers and things like that. So all issues aren't addressed on the spot. 
Some take a long time, but we log them, we capture them, and staff is but you a hell see, of my, my, my thing is really important, and I want it handled today. <laughs> But I don't want to pay any more for government, so you Understood. can't have any more people. Well, we try to do more. We try to do more with less, but there's a limit to that too. There's a limit. And that, that's really the problem. I guess part of it is patience. As long as you see there's a process, and I think that's been well explained, Brian, that you mm -hmm. you do have a process, and there is a tracking device, even though it takes a little time. Mm -hmm. Something's happening all the way, and they could find out if they don't bug you every five minutes. I found out that one day I was bugging somebody about finding something for me and they went through their paperwork and pulled it out and they told me where it was and then dropped it on the bottom of the tray again. <laughs> I'd lost my place in the lost pile. Your place. Yeah. So bugging doesn't help a lot of times. There is a process and reasonable follow-up is mm -hmm. important, but calling every day to see where it is probably will stop it or, or at least cut down on the availability of information. Yeah, it hinders uh, staff's ability to be effective. But our customers deserve information. So if you're following time. up because you haven't heard anything, right. that's entirely acceptable. Then it's on us to make sure that you have the information that you need. And if I need to tell you that you won't hear from me for two weeks, then I need to do that. So those yeah, two weeks don't go exactly. Too. Those two weeks don't go by, and you're wondering what's happening. Nothing's happening, and then you become critical. But if you know you're not going to hear from me for two weeks, you can go on your way okay and do something it. else and exactly. expect it in two exactly. weeks. Exactly. We have service level guarantees for many of the services offered by the county, and that's an internal function. So depending on what the issue is, staff has a defined amount of time to respond. Oh, really? Depending on what the issue is, absolutely. And we try to do that with every service. So every staffer knows, regardless of what the issue is, how long they have to respond. For example, if you have a solid waste issue, if your trash didn't get picked up, if the trash truck flattens your mailbox or something of that nature, you need a call back right away. That's a fairly serious issue. You need at least to have that trash cleaned up or your mailbox fixed. So for something like that, you need to hear from staff within 24 hours. You know, if it's a missed pickup, you want it picked up within 24 hours also. But if it's something else, if it's overgrowth, if it's a branch hanging, if it's something like that, five days may be a reasonable amount of time for you to get a response for staff to come out and take a look and say, yep, he's right, that's a problem, we need to do something about it, and now it's on my calendar to, to fix. Dealing with homeowners associations, a lot of people are elected to boards of these things because either they missed a meeting and somebody <laughs> put their name in and voted them in, or two, they didn't have the, the nerve to say, no, I don't want to do this, mm -hmm. but rather said, okay, I'll do it, and I'll serve. Or somebody went to them and said, listen, there's really not much to this, just go ahead and fill your name in and sit on the board. How your department has some training for these people in homeowners association? Do you not? We do, and you're absolutely right. A lot of officers of condo associations and homeowner associations and other civic associations end up as officers because number one, they're a concerned citizen and they want to make a contribution in their neighborhood. But very often, they're filling a void. Someone's needed. They're interested. They're available. They say, "Okay, I'll give this a try and I'll help out." And I'm guilty also. Initially, in the first neighborhood that I owned a home in, <laughs> I ended up vice president and president the following year for that same reason. I want to help. Newbie, you I'm, got I'm a newbie. I'm, I'm willing. I want to help. Get the and new there's guy. something to be done. So what we've realized is that there are so many people who do that. They want to help. They're energetic. They're excited about it but they don't know what they're doing. They don't know the history. They don't know what the requirements are. Legal responsibilities. What the legal responsibilities are. There are legal responsibilities to being uh, an HOA homeowner association officer and even more to being a condo association officer. And that's the nature of many of the calls we receive. We'll get calls from these new folks, these newly crowned officers saying, what now? <laughs> what now? How do I do this? Or we have this problem, or we have overgrowth, or we've got tremendous problems with foreclosure and vacancies, and you know, whatever the issue is, and how do I begin to address these issues? So as we've started to look at the trend of calls and the information being requested, we realized that there was a need to discuss these sorts of things. So at um, our annual neighborhood conference, we put together a seminar where we would talk about these things, and the demand kept growing and growing, and the interest was so incredible that we came up with the idea of doing an officer training. We have uh, two separate training tracks, one for homeowner associations, because those requirements are pretty specific, and we have one for condo officer Oh, you have two different ones. We have two okay. different ones. Um, we've held the first session already last month, and currently they're running every, on the fourth Thursday of every month, 
and we have uh, six months scheduled. So we'll, we'll go every fourth Thursday through June. And then in July, the seventh one will be more of a social and a wrap up, uh, sort of prevent, present uh, certificates, that sort of thing. So there are six sessions to address specific curricula. One a month. One, one per they month. They last how long? They are about two hours. About I think we're scheduled uh, okay. 6.30 to 8.30 on those evenings each Thursday, and they take place at the same time. Currently, the HOA training, the Homeowners Association Officer Training, is being held in the county boardroom on the second floor of the county center, okay. and the Condo Association Training is also in the county center, but up on the 26th floor. We currently have about 1,000 registered Homeowner Association, Condo Association, and Civic Associations registered in our database. So really? So 1,000 associations here in the county, which is fantastic. I figure about five officers each? Between five and seven officers each. So we're in the neighborhood of five to 7,000 officers. And of course, we can't accommodate everyone at this point. And since this was our first time offering this specific training, we didn't know what the response would be. We knew we had the interest. Sort of a test. Ed, it huh? was really a test. And the response has been overwhelming. We actually maxed out our space. So the wow. homeowner association training is closed. We are on a wait list. So please, don't show up on the fourth <laughs> Thursday unless you call first because if your name isn't on the list, we will not be able to accommodate you. Please call. Get on the list if you well, are they can interested. call your number. We can call the number that was given, okay. and we'll let you know where you stand and, and uh, if we have capacity for that week. For the condo officer training, the uh, response has been a little less because there are fewer condo associations here in town. There's still capacity for those sessions. But they will have missed at least one they session. They missed the first one, yes, the, the January session. Okay. Uh, the February one will be coming up, and that is available, that's so which, please call. Which went, which it's also the fourth Thursday. Thursday. They're both at the same time. So this will air in time for some of them to see absolutely. that. Absolutely, absolutely. So we have plenty of capacity for the condo association uh, training session. And as I said, it will go, go on through June with a wrap-up in July. And based on the response that we've had so far, we will host this again next year. Uh, we'll target the fall. We'll see. The fall is a busy time for us, particularly with uh, storm season. So we may end up moving it to January again next year. But based yeah. on the interest that we've had so far, we will do it again. It's turned out to be one of the most popular and, in my opinion, most impactful programs Neighborhood Relations has ever offered. Well, I think that would be a, a good thing if people want to get on the list for next time to call you now. Absolutely. Because that will give you some idea of whether you're going to run it again. Oh, we'll, we'll run of... it. We'll definitely <laughs> run it. We just don't know when or where. And right okay. now I'm, I'm actually in the process of looking for an alternate location. Yeah, I was going to say downtown is kind of a hard, I mean, to come downtown at night, <clears throat> especially during the winter time, uh, is, would be something that might stop me from going where if I was going over to a library somewhere or some other mm -hmm. civic center, uh, I might be more likely to be a little go. more attractive, attractive. Well, don't tell the lightning that you've said that because they like for folks to come downtown <laughs> at night. But uh, it, there, it is a challenge. We understand that. Sometimes parking's an issue. Uh, but the problem is, as you mentioned when we started, is cost. We own the county center. We have a meeting room. That's true. It is set up for production because we are taping these sessions. Oh. So if we go to an alternate location, we are looking at facility rental. We are looking at moving staff. It becomes more of a remote production. So our focus was on the county center, but because we have maxed out our space, we are looking at alternate locations. And uh, if we come up with something that works for us, then then we'll make a change along the way so that we can accommodate more people. Our capacity in the boardroom is in the range of 140 people, between 130 and 140. And uh, as I said, we've exceeded that number so far. So we're looking at options. And you know, going forward next year, you know, based on the response we've had, it maybe it will make sense to, to go ahead and begin at a larger facility. That brings me to the question, if you're videotaping, is that going up on county television? Absolutely. It will. So that was the purpose for doing that. We'll make it available. Um, HTV, County, County Central, will make the um, tapes available. We'll air on the county channel. They're in the process of doing the post-production, you know, mm -hmm. adding the mm -hmm. um, uh, graphics that are necessary yeah. and uh, subtitles, which we, we like to do for all of our productions also. Uh, so it'll be a while before they are available, but the plan is that they're all being taped and they will be available. And then neighborhood relations staff will have discs available for association meetings that they attend on a regular basis. The nice thing about that also is that the, the tapes will be subject specific. For example, the first session may specifically relate to uh, covenants and legal requirements. 
So you can pull a specific program to review. Another one may be on statute, you know, 920 or, or whichever statute governs your uh, association or condo. You know, so you, you can pull specifically which one you want to watch. Oh, this is wonderful. Mm -hmm. and, and you may want to consider, I don't know what Hillsborough Television wants to do, but these programs that you're watching right now, if you go to HodgesVideos.com, 30 days after we tape this, then it goes up there, and anybody around the world can watch it. And I find mm -hmm. that being able to go into the Internet and look at something at my own time is a very valuable thing. And Homeowners Association could certainly do that if it were on the net. Absolutely. That's Not only here, but all over. <laughs> all over, all over the world. If you have access to the Internet, you have access to it. So a lot of our residents, whom we affectionately refer to as snowbirds, when they head back north during the summer, they can still watch these programs. And, and be prepared to come back and be board members. Absolutely, because they will have been elected in their absence. So That's they'll, right. <laughs> they'll come back with added responsibility. But we're also in the process of implementing what we call video on demand. You know, Hillsborough uh, Television is. And that allows you to index that footage. So you don't have to watch a three-hour meeting oh, that'd be looking nice. for a five-minute discussion that you're interested in. You can put in a keyword and go specifically to that section of the footage. And that's a part of what's causing the delay before we get it on the air is, you know, working out all the bugs of uh, video on demand and getting everything uh, keyword driven and the footnotes put in also. I think this would be a fabulous thing. It is. It is. It's fantastic. It is a wonderful program that's extremely well received uh, and it is virtually at no cost. Because well, you say we're virtually, virtually at, no at no cost. When we say we're virtually, virtually, yes, virtually. Is there a county charge for going to? No, 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 no. Oh. There's no charge for the participants at oh, all. Oh, okay. I meant, all right. That's. I meant to 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 host the event itself. You know, we didn't yeah. create a program right. that I had to request additional budget for. Right. We're using existing using staff. Exactly. We're using existing facilities, things of that nature. So well, that room is a great room. There's it's no a fantastic room. It. It's you've very got comfortable. audio visual in there. You've got mm -hmm. everything in there. Cameras, everything set up. Yep. So that makes it a really good. Going That's to a library, I can see if you're going mm -hmm. to video these, it becomes a lot harder to do. It becomes more difficult. We'll have to take the remote truck out, and as I said, it becomes a bigger production at that point. It's still an option if the demand warrants it, but the first option was to stay in the building. Well, I was and thinking the, of, uh, I live down Sun City Center, okay. and a lot of our residents are older. And coming down at night, because mm -hmm. a lot of them don't like to drive at night, Exactly. coming down to the county building at night is really not an option for them. Mm -hmm. uh, having it in one of our facilities or out there would be a, a better thing. It would be. It would be. As I said, we didn't have... But the video might a, just... Cause it's even a nice bridge. The, even though the people in Sun City are older, I got to tell you, they're up to date. They're very these, savvy. It's amazing mm -hmm. to me how many of these people in their 70s and 80s are very internet savvy. Mm -hmm. They've learned it from their kids. If they want to keep in touch with them, they've got to learn how to use this keyboard and how to do that. You know, there's well, one since, last since, thing. Since I manage the county's call center and email traffic, I can attest to what you just said. We hear from a lot of Sun City <laughs> residents by email, by phone, and you're absolutely right. They are very tuned in and very savvy. And they vote, so people pay vote. attention to them. <laughs> the other thing that I want to touch with, and we only have about four minutes before okay. we finish, and I want to be sure to get this in, there is a neighborhood conference coming up, is there not, in March? There is. There is. Another program that the Office of Neighborhood Relations runs is the annual neighborhood conference, and it will be held this year on March 21st at HCC Del Mabry campus. It's an annual event, and it's set up just as a seminar. And it, it, the, the focus is also on addressing issues of neighborhood concern. We'll have 24 different seminars during that morning. Wow. We have a breakfast. It includes a lunch. It includes an awards uh, program as a part of the luncheon. It's attended by uh, a good chunk of our county commissioners, and Pat Bean presents the awards to the neighborhoods that, that uh, are being recognized for different programs. It's a wonderful event. Call the same number. If you're interested, you can go to the county's website for more specific information on the program. Uh, there is a charge for that. Twelve dollars in advance and fifteen at the door, but we'd like that to includes to, breakfast to call and ahead. lunch. That includes a continental breakfast, a plate at lunch, um, and a gift bag for our participants. Wow, it's <laughs> pretty amazing. We we absolutely can anybody maximize, go to maximize this? these resources. Can anybody go to this, or do you have to be a board member from an association or something? No, uh, the neighborhood conference is available to any of our county residents, whether you're an officer or not, because it allows you, as a concerned citizen, to learn more about 
how to address issues in your neighborhood and how to access county government. You know, uh, uh, as a part of the neighborhood conference, we'll have an, an expo where we'll have different departments represented. They'll have booths providing information about who they are and what they do. Um, so in addition to attending the seminars, just going through the expo and collecting information from each department's booth provides a wealth of information. Yeah, you said neighborhoods will have booths? Not neighborhoods, oh. county departments. County so public department. works, for example, okay. will have a booth and they'll talk about what it is they do and how they address different issues such as stormwater runoff. You know, a code enforcement may have a booth, animal services may have a booth, things of that nature. So as a participant, you can meet specific department reps in person because they will be there manning their booths and collect the information that they have on the programs that they offer. Wow. Brian, we're, we're down to the very short time. Okay. Is there anything that we haven't covered, and I know we didn't cover anything in depth, but they know the phone numbers and they, they can the call you, number. but is there anything that you really want to get across? There are two things uh, that I want to get across. I mentioned that we have a thousand, approximately a thousand associations listed with us in our database. That allows us to contact them. There is a second database called a registry, and it's very specific. It's different. It's listed in the comprehensive plan. If you, as a neighborhood, as a neighborhood representative, would like to be contacted when an application is filed for a variance that may affect your neighborhood, most recently with the soccer stadium that was proposed, when that application is filed, Planning and Growth Management looks at the registry and then contacts the neighborhoods in a certain radius and lets them know right. that this has been applied. Now we have to go to number okay. two very quickly. Okay, no, I'll skip seconds. number two because this is more important. <laughs> so okay. it's important that neighborhoods are in the registry, not just that they've contacted us and they're in our database. They have to specifically request to be in the registry. Registry. And that way okay. you will be notified when something is applied that will impact your neighborhood. Otherwise you find out after the fact that lights have been approved or a road has been approved or a stadium has been built. And that's not the time You to don't want to find out then. You want to be notified when the application is filed so that you can attend those initial hearings. Brian, so that's critical. I, I, you've just done a wonderful job. And, and your department sounds like one that I don't mind my tax money going into <laughs> because obviously you're doing a lot for us. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Brian Johnson. He's the Executive Director of the Office of Neighborhood Ser Relations. And do call those numbers. Remember, you're unique, you're special, and you're great. Tell yourself so often, because you are, you know. We'll see you on the next Spotlight on Government. Again, Brian, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. It's my pleasure.